Hi, everyone. Welcome to our session on technology. As a gentle reminder, as we start our last session for the day, I'd like to remind you to keep your video and audio off during the presentation. If you have any questions at any time, please feel free to enter them in the chat window. Each presentation will be 10 minutes in total, five minutes with the presenter uh, speaking uh, to their slide, and then a five minute opportunity for questions and answers. As another reminder, we are recording our session. And during the question and answer period, use the raise hand function if you would like to ask a question or type it into chat as I will be monitoring the chat as well. I will call on you so that you can ask your question. And at that time, please unmute your audio so that you can ask your question and then put your audio back on once you've finished asking the question. So thank you very much for joining us for the technology session. And we're going to move into the first presentation which will be given by Andrew Laguidis. I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing this <laughs> correctly. Better than most actually. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect, am I good to go? You are good to go. Perfect, so my name is Andrew Lojudice. I am a fourth year, uh, I'm a fourth year PhD student at McMaster. And without any further ado, I'll get started. Um, so clinicians are often forced to make rapid decisions about how sick or ill a patient is. Uh, basically, you know, is this patient sick enough to warrant admitting them to the ward, or are they not sick, in which case they can be discharged home safely? Now, informally, this is referred to as eyeballing the, the illness severity of the patient. Clearly, this is a really important skill, especially in emergency medicine situations, but we don't really know a whole lot about how it works or how it can best be trained. Um, interestingly, people have started thinking about this in terms of dual process models of decision making. Uh, in this context, briefly, Type 1 processing is, might be said to occur if the clinician has a lot of prior experiences and memory that are highly similar to the, the patient at hand, in which case they can draw upon those prior experiences to kind of unconsciously kind of come up with the right answer. Um, you know, it's intuitive, it's fast, and almost like a gut feeling. In contrast, type 2 processing might be said to occur when those prior situations are not there in memory, in which case they have to go through the task more effortfully, slowly, kind of sifting through the data from more of a, a bottom-up approach. So we reason that this dual process logic makes an interesting prediction about how clinicians will kind of perceive their decision making. We asked, will reports of deliberation across cases resemble a type one, type two dissociation? In other words, if you have a particular clinician um, and you give them a bunch of patients to kind of diagnose a sick or not, you might expect, according to the dual process logic, that a lot of these would be clustered under more of type one in the sense that the clinician says, no, that was very intuitive for me. I didn't have to think about it much, uh, in contrast to the more type two cases, which are on the right. And so as you can see in this little diagram, type one's kind of corresponding to type one and um, sorry, blue is corresponding to type one, green to type two. Uh, it almost looks like a, you might predict a, a bimodal distribution. Moreover, we were interested in whether this dissociation would be supported by response time and eye gaze patterns, so in terms of eye tracking. Uh, I'll go through these relatively quickly, but feel free to ask me questions later if, you, if anything's unclear. Uh, you might expect the more type 2 cases to correspond to a longer response time. Um, number of fixations refers to while scanning a scene, um, basically how many, at how many points the, the participant kind of focuses their eye gaze in one particular point in which case you might expect them to do that more often for a type two type scenario. Um, total scan path length is similar in that it's kind of just the total distance that their eye movement covers. Again, if they're sifting through the information in a, a bottom-up manner, you'd expect that to be higher for type two. And the ratio of local to global saccades is a little tricky. Um, a local, local saccade you can think of as basically a short eye movement, less than one degree of visual angle in this case, and a global saccade is greater than one degree visual angle. So in short, you can think of this ratio as the tendency for a participant to make kind of small, fine-grained eye movements as opposed to uh, global eye movements. Okay, so let's get into the actual task. I'll direct your attention to the middle column for the method. We recruited 20 residents um, from Hamilton Health Science Care Centers, most of whom were specialized in emergency medicine. And we had 25 cases made using videos of real patients presenting to an emergency department. So these, carries, these cases varied based on where the patient actually ended up in real life, either sent home to the ward or to intensive care. 
uh, participants were brought into a controlled laboratory setting. Um, they, we equipped them with a, an eye tracking system and there was a monitor that displayed the cases. So basically this is what one of the cases might look like. So you have on the left, you can see there are two boxes that are strictly just videos of the visual information related to the patient. And on the right, there was a still photo of the vitals monitor. So uh, participants were asked to kind of scan the information accordingly um, and we recorded their eye movements and to say done out loud once they were ready to assess illness severity. Once they said done, the researcher logged their reaction time and then the participant was asked two questions. Uh, first, is this person sick on a continuous scale from definitely no to definitely yes? And lastly, how did you decide? So this is kind of more in line with the, the type one, type two dissociation. Uh, type one would be kind of more on the left there, which would be um, intuitive and on the right would be deliberated intently. So first off, I just wanna say that they could perform the task with reasonable accuracy. You can see in panel A on the right there, that sick ratings varied as a function of the case type severity. But more importantly, we're interested in the deliberation ratings from these clinicians. Um, and as you can see, this is all trials across all participants, and it almost approximates that bimodal distribution that we talked about earlier. Uh, so we, we conducted a median split within subjects. So for each subject, half their trials were considered type one and half considered type two. And you can see in the graphs there that all the metrics we described earlier um, were larger for the type two trials than type one trials. Uh, in conclusion, uh, these data are support this idea that eyeballing illness severity follows a uh, dual process logic. Uh, admittedly, this is more of a descriptive project in nature, but uh, we're also interested and we're working on some projects now looking at uh, whether we can kind of augment this type one process uh, by giving patients, by training them with a lot of different cases, kind of like a rapid exposure type procedure. Uh, yeah, and I just want to say at the top right there are all my collaborators. I just want to thank them for helping me with such an interesting project, and I'm eager to answer any questions. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, really interesting study. Um, I'll just wait to see if uh, some uh, questions come up in the chat, or if anyone has any questions, please raise your hand. Um, in the meantime, I, I'm quite curious as you, you know, you started talking about uh, perhaps using different cases to help, I guess, sort of build that eyeballing capacity uh, around illness severity. What do you think this might translate to in terms of practice or training for residents or medical students? Yeah, it's a good question. I'll admit that I don't have much direct experience with this because um, I'm not in medicine. But at the same time, I think it's interesting because it may be, yeah, it tells you that you have to have this direct experience with patients. Like something about going through this process is important. And I'd be willing to wager that it's not sufficient to just watch somebody else do it. My guess is that something about going through the steps yourself and having to do that might be a critical ingredient for kind of augmenting type one. Uh, admittedly, that is speculation, but that's kind of my, my inkling for that question. Perfect. We have a question from uh, Lanika. Have you or will you compare uh, what your results or your, do your study with expert clinicians? Uh, that's a great question. Um, so in the interest of time, I didn't have time to cover my whole lit review here. But uh, prior work by Cabrera et al. and also Sybil et al. who's on this project um, have done this similar work but with more expert clinicians. Um, I don't know if they've looked at this bimodal type distribution. Um, I believe Matt Sybil has said that he didn't find the same dissociation with more uh, expert-like clinicians. So it does raise an interesting question about, you know, is is this being observed just because we have a less experienced population here? Maybe as you get more experienced, it shifts almost entirely to the, the type one side. Perfect, thank you. Okay. Uh, we have a comment uh, from David Rodriguez, uh, uh, cool talk, and wondering if the patient's disposition was the correct disposition. I, should some of the discharge patients been admitted? Similarly, should some of the ICU patients go to the ward? That's a good question. Uh, admittedly, I'm not, I'm not sure about this one. Um, my guess is that there's, there's no way to know for sure if it was the correct disposition. I, I suppose in this case, it was just a proxy for what actually happened to this patient. Um, yeah, other than that, I'm not, not entirely sure about that one. Okay, uh, we'll move on to a question by Simon McCormick. 
did you look at what exactly was clinicians or at what exactly it was that clinicians were looking at to make the decisions? You know, I wanted to do this originally, but as I sifted through the data and even just trying to get a sense, like the, the eye tracking software will kind of replay their eye gaze patterns. Um, it was a lot harder to draw any kind of concrete conclusions. Um, there was a very variable across clinicians. It's not as though they all kind of followed the same uh, recipe, so to speak. Um, so I'm, I'm reluctant to comment on any qualitative patterns, but maybe that's something that's worth exploring a little bit more. So thanks for that question. Perfect. Um, and just in the interest of time and keeping us on track, there are more questions that are showing up in the chat window. And Andrew, if I can bestow upon you perhaps to look at those questions and answer via chat uh, as we continue on in the session. Please note also there are some resources that be, are being shared with links uh, out to additional uh, resources and supports for you. Thank you very much, Andrew. Excellent. Thank you. Okay. And I'd like to invite uh, Jason McConnery to start off his presentation. Hey there. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Bayer, for, uh, for uh, moderating this talk. Uh, my name is Jason McConnery, and I'm a third year pediatrics resident here at McMaster. Uh, I'd like to thank the NERD Organizing Committee for allowing me to share our work here today. Um, our project is engagement in and performance of spaced repetition of academic half day content in a pediatric residency program. And uh, my co-investigators are Dr. Basilius and Dr. No. Uh, so academic half-day curricula are used in residency programs to supplement clinical learning. Uh, but these are often didactic, and in that, they can limit full engagement. They're also simply discrete exposures, which are quickly forgotten without focused review. And that can become challenging with the time pressures of residency. So as the academic half-day resident lead for our program, I wanted to improve the effectiveness of learning in our half day using established pedagogical principles, namely uh, spaced repetition. And we thought we could use technology to deliver this more efficiently. Uh, spaced repetition uses gradually lengthening intervals between exposures to combat naturally exponential knowledge decay. And this stands in contrast to mass repetition, which many of you may know more colloquially as cramming. Uh, our hypothesis was that this e-education study tool would find high participation for its inherent value and that full participation would improve knowledge retention and testing performance. This was a prospective head-to-head -head trial with 39 pediatric residents comparing our spaced repetition intervention to uh, control. We had active repetitions on day one and day eight after half day and we delivered this using Google Forms. Uh, day one consists of three pearls from the lecture and an interrogation of how the knowledge might change practice. And that was really just to make the exposure a little bit more active than just reading three key pearls. Day eight was a multiple choice question uh, with an explanation of the answer offered after submitting, uh, just to deepen that learning. We tested distant retention then at day 29 and compared that to performance in an unreinforced control question from the same half day. We then repeated this over 17 weeks and then surveyed experience with the tool. Our primary and secondary outcomes were first participation and then performance. As you can see in table one under the participated column, first row, nearly 80% of residents tried the tool at least once. Uh, next, I'll remind you that there were 17 weeks. So you can see in the over nine weeks column in the first row that 36% uh, or just over one third of residents participated more than half the time. So clearly quite a drop off for durable participation. I didn't show this data, but interestingly, only two residents out of 39 completed all 17 weeks. Table two below that shows overall engagement. With 17 weeks and 39 residents, we had a total of 663 possible responses. Under the overall column, first row, you can see that 37.4% of engagements were completed. Our intervention required approximately five and a half minutes per week, which was a small time investment as intended due to that uh, time pressure of residency as mentioned before. Um, but the range was anywhere from just over two minutes to nearly 20 minutes. Uh, although from a week to week, sometimes uh, there would be fewer questions or fewer things to engage with, depending on what was being reinforced. Um, 
And so that, uh, that five and a half minutes actually made up a small digestible portion of residents weekly self reported study time, which was around 70 minutes, you can see that just below. Um, the tool was rated as highly helpful to reinforcing the content in question and to general learning for those who used it. Finally, in figure one uh, for a secondary objective, in the first bars, overall, you can see there was, in the end, no significant difference in performance. Um, we assessed for question difficulty just to, to make sure, and there was a non-significant trend towards the reinforced questions being more difficult. So we didn't apply statistical controls, but we keep that in the back of our minds um, if we'd had more data. I'll point out another interesting trend with reversal across years where PGY1s actually did worse on reinforced content and PGY3s seemed to get uh, more advantage out of the reinforcement. To note, we weren't powered for the subgroup analysis of years, but we're keeping an eye on this. So what does all of this mean? Well, the tool had high satisfaction, participation was limited, likely due to barriers experienced by residents, limited time being the most commonly cited reason. While performance was not enhanced, our secondary analysis was impaired by limited participation in this case, which led to a selection bias. In fact, only five residents made up over half of our analyzed responses. Uh, the reversal in performance across post-grad years is interesting as well. And we wonder whether previous clinical exposures may act as a foundation for PGY3s to experience our discrete repetitions as more effective in reinforcing long-term retention compared to PGY1s who may be only seeing this content for the very first time. How these repetitive exposures for PGY1s may impact their future learning in the program is beyond the scope of the study, but uh, an interesting thought. And uh, unsurprisingly and reassuringly, I'm happy to announce that with more years of pediatric residency, final performance on all questions improved. Residency works. To conclude, uh, space repetition is a proven strategy for learning that was not shown to be effective in this study, likely due to the noted limitations. So implementation has to consider operational barriers to improve participation, and we're considering multiple strategies for this. I'd like to thank Dr. Noah and Dr. Basilius for their guidance, as well as to the dedicated faculty who offered great lectures and provided useful pearls and challenge questions for this study. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, Jason. Uh, first, uh, just to share some comments uh, with you uh, from Jonathan Sherbino, congratulations for adopting learning sciences to a curriculum intervention. Uh, similarly echoed by Teresa Chan, great work. And her question is, how might we encourage participation? And would you also use focus groups or end user interviews perhaps to collect some information? So sort of a two part question there. Great, so uh, that's, that's, a, that's a really great question and I'm happy to report that uh, this, uh, this study has actually been a, a launching point for a sort of a secondary quality improvement uh, sort of approach to this. So um, the way that we're hoping to encourage participation is we've come up with a uh, gamification strategy. So I, I, I imagine that uh, Celeste's ears are probably pricking up. Um, so we are introducing a sort of a points and uh, badge and leadership system to, or a leaderboard system to encourage that participation. And what we're actually hoping to do is uh, we're going to conduct uh, quarterly focus groups uh, as well as an end user interview as well um, to track uh, participation barriers throughout the year. Um, and we're just uh, making some other operational um, uh, barriers. Uh, obviously it takes a lot of time for, uh, for, to put all of this together. Um, so uh, we're planning on using um, uh, commercially available uh, question banks uh, going forward. Uh, in our case, uh, prep questions from the AAP. Excellent. Um, adding on to that, because you mentioned barriers, um, ties very nicely into a question by Sally Binks, who's asking, how do you think the institutional barriers can be overcome? Mm -hmm. So I think from an institutional barrier perspective, like the main thing is going to be the amount of time um, and then the enormous cognitive load that residents um, that residents are exposed to. Um, it's hard enough to remember to do uh, this brief intervention per week to improve the effectiveness of your half day um, when you're worrying about all the other clinical responsibilities, research responsibilities you have. Um, so um, one of the things that we are considering and we're wondering if we might see this in the, our focus groups is if we may be having to identify a specific uh, set aside protected time, um, probably associated with the academic half day, to uh, take advantage of that spaced repetition interval um, and really set that, that time aside because um, uh, if we facilitate it in that way, we'll probably see higher participation from the barriers perspective because again, that is 
it, it's it's mostly time. Excellent. And I'm just going to uh, jump in with sort of the last question. And looking at your data, the, the, you know, while you mentioned it's not statistically significant, that the PGY1s showed um, lower performance with the reinforced. Do you have any thoughts on why that might have happened? Or that res you may have had that result? Yeah, yeah. So uh, again, as you pointed out, we weren't powered to detect a difference, but um, I, I do wonder if there is some component of uh, this uh, exposure to distractors. We know that distractors, when they are um, not well designed, um, can be quite confusing. And for PGY1s who have limited clinical experience to sort of um, wade their way through um, the complexity of that question, because some of these questions were uh, were difficult, um, that maybe those initial exposures might have actually uh, distracted them. Um, and that may also be emphasized as well by the, um, by the impact of uh, uh, the difficulty of the questions. As, again, as I mentioned, it's not statistically significant, but uh, there was a trend towards the reinforced questions actually being more challenging. Um, so as we roll this out further, it'll be quite interesting to, to see with uh, more participation and more questions. We're, we're doing a full year uh, rollout for, this, for, uh, for the next study. Excellent. We look forward to seeing more results from this. And Jason, I'll just ask that um, you keep an eye on the chat. There might be some other questions around your presentation um, throughout the remainder of this session. Thank, Thank you. you very much. And thanks for We're the great questions. We're going to move on to the next presenter, and I'd like to welcome Alex back. So it's actually not Alex. Um, my name is Sakshi. And so my name is Sakshi and I'm going to be talking to you all about the virtual reality bell ringer headset or the VRBR headset and why it is promising for testing anatomy. So anatomy, as many of you may know, is an important part of the curriculum in many undergraduate and graduate programs. As technology evolves, we need to find new, effective and innovative ways to make this curriculum more accessible for students. This is especially important when you take into account the current state that we're in with COVID-19 and the need for distance learning and testing. So traditionally, a bell ringer has been used to test anatomical knowledge in a lab setting. In a bell ringer assessment, students would rotate around stations that have various cadaveric specimens and they must identify key structures that have been pinned and the structures functioned as well. The problem with these tests is that they can be time and resource intensive for faculty and staff, and they also rely on body donation and cadaver availability. Thus, what we wanted to do was to evaluate the effectiveness of the VRBR application as an alternative to traditional bell ringers for testing anatomy knowledge. The VRBR application is essentially an app that can be downloaded onto your phone, and it can be used alongside the Google Cardboard headset to view images. We also wanted to examine the role that stereopsis, which is how we perceive depth, plays by comparing 2D and 3D images in the VRBR headset. So we recruited participants from the undergraduate health science and graduate physiotherapy programs at McMaster University who were at the time enrolled within an anatomy course. So if you look at figure one, um, figure one shows that participants were randomized to a single track, so either group one, group two, or group three, and each group underwent all three modalities in a different order. So the three modalities are traditional, which is just your traditional bell ringer that's lab-based and it has physical cadavers that you're interacting with, 2D, which is using the VRBR headset and seeing 2D images, and 3D, which is using the VRBR headset and seeing 3D images. All of the test questions were held constant across each individual test. So for example, all of test A had the same specimens presented. They were just presented through a different modality for different participants. After participants completed all three tests, they did a mental rotation test, which assesses the participants' mental rotations ability. And also they completed the stereo fly test, which, is assess which assesses stereo acuity. There was also a post-test survey about cyber sickness and VRBR usability to gain more qualitative data. Table one, uh, which is like right in the middle, shows participant demographics and test scores. So even though we recruited two different samples, which are the undergraduate and the graduate students, we found no statistical difference in the results when comparing test scores. Thus, the scores from undergraduate and graduate students were combined. As you can see in table two, which is right below, all scores were collapsed across test versions to create average modality scores. 
and then all three modality scores were averaged to calculate the overall average anatomy score. And then a repeated measures ANCOVA was conducted to find the effect of modality on test performance. So table two is also color coded to relate to figure two, which is right below. So as you can see in figure two, um, the traditional and 3D VRBR methods are significantly better than 2D VRBR. Thus, if we were to bring VRBR use into a curriculum such as anatomy, 3D VRBR would be best because it is comparable to the traditional methods that are already being used. We concluded that the use of VRBR is promising for its affordability and accessibility during testing. However, one of the drawbacks we found was that 63% of students reported moderate to severe symptoms in at least one category in the cyber sickness survey. So as you can see in figure three, the most common symptoms were difficulty focusing, eye strain, and difficulty concentrating. So in figure three, everything that is essentially not that dark blue color is a reported symptom. This is very important to note because the students reporting symptoms or similar symptoms to this may be at a disadvantage for examinations that require its use. Going forward, we would definitely need to explore whether their cyber sickness symptoms have any statistical significance to test performance. The end user experience is equally as important as the testing performance, and since it will be students who are using the VRBR headset, they should be able to enjoy the experience that they undergo while testing. So to end off, I do want to thank the body donors to the education program in anatomy at McMaster University, and I'll open up the floor up to any questions that you may have. Great, thank you very much. Um, I see we've got a question already popping in from Teresa Chan. As a person with strabismus and I'm challenged by the 3D viewing technology, such as 3D movies, she's agree, she agrees. So actually, sorry, it was more of a comment uh, than checking with that. But leading into that kind of connection that there are individuals with eye difficulties, such as strabismus, uh, challenges with viewing 3D, and the reported symptoms related to sort of the cyber sickness. Any thoughts on, you know, where this might be useful, um, perhaps going forward in a curriculum setting? Yeah, for sure. So we still have to kind of compare whether the symptoms that students experienced um, did have an impact on test per performance. So if students are, do have conditions similar to this and they are experiencing these symptoms, they would be at a disadvantage, which is definitely not something that we want. But again, like further research would be needed before like we can come to a definitive conclusion for sure. Okay. And I'm just curious from your own experience, um, have you had, have you gone through that, through looking at the specimens yourselves through the VRBR compared to what it's like to look at these specimens in the lab and how would you comment on that different experience between the virtual reality and the physical anatomical specimens? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, personally, in last year, I did use the VRBR headset as a part of my anatomy course. I just used, it wasn't a part of the testing, but I did use it to kind of practice at home, which was really useful for me. For example, if I didn't want to go into the lab one day, I would just be at home kind of practicing the bell ringers on my own. Um, for me, they were very, very useful. I did experience some of the symptoms that users experience as well, such as eye strain and like difficulty focusing. However, personally, as I progress and like as I used it more, those symptoms did lessen for me. So again, that's just my experience, but I'm interested to see how like other people would interact with this as well. Okay, and that actually ties in very nicely with uh, another question uh, that Andrew has. Is there any evidence that some of these concerns related to cyber sickness will go away once they get more used to it? So did you see any trends or your own personal experience within your cohort within anatomy? Yeah, so we, our, um, our experiment wasn't over a great time period. So it was just kind of like a one sitting. So we did only ex um, interact with the participants that one time. Um, again, like my personal experience for me, the symptom did lessen as I went along. And I know a few of my friends also used it as well and like their symptoms lessened as well. Um, however, again, more research would need to be done to see whether that is, a, that is statistically significant. Excellent, thank you. And from Sam, uh, Jarman, have you received any student feedback at this point that is promising for improving the user experience? Yeah, one of the things um, along with the cyber sickness survey, we also did have like um, a section where students could get, get feedback and we did receive some of the feedback that we would like to incorporate going forward. Um, so some students didn't like the ability that 
although you can zoom in and out using the headset, you can't really move around the specimen. So that's something that could be um, integrated going forward and yeah. Excellent, and I know from teaching anatomy myself, that ability to move around the specimen certainly plays into an understanding of the specimen structure and orientation as well. And our last question, uh, and again, related to the cyber sickness, I think this is a common issue that must uh, comes up in a lot of interest around it. Um, did it correlate with the amount of time spent learning? Was everybody in the study spending the same amount of time in the experiment or were there differences in the time they spent that might have correlated with cyber sickness symptoms? Yeah, so all the students we tried to keep pretty constant in terms of um, their formal education. So they were all currently enrolled, well, at the time of the study, they were enrolled in an anatomy course. Um, most of them, this was like their first time kind of sitting down with a VR, VR headset and doing a bell ringer. And the time that they spent like at the bell ringer doing it during the experiment was all uniform across all participants. So essentially um, the three tracks, they had two minutes for each specimen and like each, um, each modality, they had 10 minutes at that station. So the time was pretty, like it was exactly equal throughout all participants that they spent viewing the specimen through the headset. Perfect, thank you. Thanks very much, Saski. All right, so if I could ask uh, Jack Yang to join us. Hello. Hi, Jack. So we'll, yeah, we'll actually have um, four presenters today. So. Okay, excellent. <laughs> All right, so uh, hi everyone. My name is John Chien and I'll be presenting today along with Veronica Jack and Ahmed. Uh, we're all health science undergraduates or recent grads at the uh, McMaster University. And let's get right into it. So uh, learning anatomy has traditionally been reliant on cadavers. Um, however, for various reasons, including the high cost of maintaining a lab, um, alternatives as well as supplements to teaching anatomy are now being looked into today. So one of these mediums is 3D printing. Uh, which is actually a technology that's really readily available today. And models that have been printed um, using this technology have been shown to be effective tools to teach anatomy um, in the health science population. So uh, what's cool about 3D printing is that we are no longer limited to the size of models that we are able to print. Um, however, there has been very limited research in this field, and that's exactly what our study tries to address. We explored whether models scaled at different sizes um, impacted students' ability to learn. So for an overview of our study methodology, you can take a look at figure one on the left there. So we recruited 380 undergraduate McMaster students and we randomized them across the group of models they were learning. So if you look at figure two on the bottom left, going from left to right, these models are the hemipelvis and vertebra or the scapula and sphenoid. They were also randomized across model size and the order in which they learned the models. During the experiment itself, participants learned and were then tested on the first model, and then this was repeated with the second model. And at the end, they completed a mental rotations test and an OSBAN task to assess visual spatial ability and working memory respectively. And finally, they completed a qualitative survey about model usability. Yeah, and from our participant testing, we were actually able to get some pretty interesting results. Now, uh, just to preface, since we use different uh, types of bone models, uh, they each have their own unique shape and structure. Uh, so that's why we decided to choose longest length as the way to quantify the actual size of the bone model. So uh, for consistency. So if you turn your attention to the top left-hand graph there, figure three, uh, we found that longest length or model size significantly affected anatomy test scores for participants. Now, when we looked into this deeper, we found that those participants who used models with longest length greater than 10 centimeters had a mean anatomy test score of at least 75% where those participants who used models with longest length less than 10 centimeters uh, scored significantly worse. Now, if you turn your attention to the right-hand graph, the figure four there, you see something else very interesting that we found, which was um, uh, those, the difference that we found between the participants who use models greater than 10 centimeters and less than 10 centimeters was only not identified within the scapula uh, group. So uh, scapula being the, the shoulder blade. 
where there was a significant difference be, uh, be found between uh, the two groups for all the other model types. So we want to look a little bit more into this. And to do this, we looked into our qualitative survey data, as Veronica mentioned. Uh, and what we did was we collected participants' responses uh, to two model features that uh, can be uh, manipulated by manipulating size as well. So uh, that being the number label size that was on the model, and then two being the um, model handling ability itself. And we collected participants' responses that were positive, neutral, and negative, and then we graphed it. So down there in figure five, uh, what's really interesting that you can see is that if you look at the green dot, or the positive comments, it shows a very, uh, very similar trend to uh, figure three up there with the anatomy test scores. Whereas if you look at the red dots or the negative uh, comments, um, it shows a very similar inverse trend to what's seen in figure three. So as noted before, the primary finding of this study is that model sizes greater than 10 centimeters on their longest diameter confer scores greater than 75% and that additional size increases for the models are not associated with any elevated benefits to learning. This suggests that students in general learn well from physical models and that the printing of larger resources, which requires more materials, time, and storage, may not be required for independent learning. The fact that only scapula models both above and below 10 centimeter threshold confer high scores and receive the most positive feedback across models may at least in part be attributed to the fact that all of the scapula landmarks can be identified within three viewing angles. So that is by looking at the model from just three different perspectives. By contrast, identifying all labels on the sphenoid requires looking at the model from at least five different angles as some regions are hidden by crevices and protrusions. The survey data suggests that larger sizing is associated with clearer labeling and easier handling, which may in turn allow for easier interaction with more intricate specimens, such as the sphenoid mentioned above. This easy ability to update artificial specimens along with their increased durability and potential to mitigate the anxiety associated with learning from cadaveric materials makes a strong case for why future explanation, exploration is warranted in learning from 3D printing. We would like to thank Dr. Kim, Dr. Finesse, Jim C, and Angela Dong for their help in, and support with the study. We would also like to thank the Education Program in Anatomy at McMaster for funding the study and their continual so support throughout. Excellent. Thank you very much. And so you started uh, finishing off with, you know, around further exploration. Where, where would be the next steps? Um, yeah, that's a great question. Um, I, I think within our data, if you um, turn attention to kind of figure figure three there, um, we see that those participants using models um, above 10 centimeters uh, all confer a very good results, very good test score. So then uh, now I guess still the question is within this range, where, what model size should we, should we make? What model size should we print? Um, and I think what we've been discussing is if we look at the very large models, uh, they still show very good scores, but participants um, within that, that reported their feedback in the qualitative surveys, they indicated that it was very hard to handle because they were too big. Uh, so then in this case, we're thinking maybe those larger models could be beneficial for group learning or uh, for teaching um, larger class sizes where it's very big, difficult to handle with one person, but maybe a lot more people can see the features and details on that model. So we're thinking that's a potential avenue to explore. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and definitely. I mean, I've had the uh, opportunity to handle some of these models as you've been working on this study. and even just being able to hold them um, when they start getting too big, it becomes a bit unwieldy to be able to actually work with it. Um, yeah. A practical question uh, has come up in the chat from Sally Banks. Great that you were able to recruit 380 participants. How long did it take to actually complete your data collection with that number of participants? Yeah, so um, the entire data collection um, took, I think, about a year and a half. Um, to get all those participants and um, actually run through them. Um, yeah, so that was definitely, um, and it was uh, the participants, they were, they were recruited from the SONA platform um, at McMaster. Excellent, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. 
All right, if anyone ha and uh, from Dr. Wayneman, it was it was a crazy. <laughs> I'm sure it was a crazy study. Lots of participation uh, and very dedicated students, both writing the study as well as participating in the study. So, um, as a member of the education program and anatomy team, I'm very happy these kind of studies are taking place. Uh, we're going to move on to the next talk. And if there are any questions uh, for this group, please put them into the chat window, and they'll monitor as we move on. Thank and you. so I'd now like to welcome Stephanie Zorka to talk about the design of technology-mediated continuing medical education. Welcome, Stephanie. I'll turn the floor over to you. Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Stephanie Zorka, and I will be presenting work that was completed as part of my master's degree to examine the design of technology-mediated continuing medical education for family physicians, or ECME. Family physicians have a professional obligation to maintain their proficiency. The educational programs offered to them are often supported by various technologies, such as webinars, video conferences, online web and mobile applications. Previous studies have found that online programs are as effective as traditional programs in changing behavior among health professionals. Despite the effectiveness of web-based programs for family physicians, there is limited detail in the literature describing the ECME offerings, including whether or not current programs are following e-learning design best practices. This is unfortunate because optimizing the way multimedia and technology are used in e-learning programs has been found to enhance knowledge acquisition and long-term retention among health professionals which can increase the likelihood of that knowledge being put into practice and ultimately having an impact on patients. For the purpose of this study, we described best practices according to nine principles devised by Clark and Mayer, which summarize decades worth of e-learning research. These principles are listed in the table on the slide. Among others, they include the multimedia principle, which states that both words and graphics should be used, and the modality principle, which states that whenever possible, audio should be used rather than on-screen text. To determine if best practices were being followed, we conducted an environmental scan of available certified Canadian ECME programs during July and August of 2019. 38 program providers were initially identified. Certain providers were excluded for reasons such as not offering educational credits, not having any topics currently available or being blocked by a paywall. Finally, 12 program providers and sample topics were reviewed in detail. The programs were reviewed with respect to their configuration, instructional methods and presentation. We also created a scoring framework, which was used to rate the programs based on their level of adherence to the e-learning design principles, where one signified very low adherence and four signified high adherence. A not applicable was also included. The programs included asynchronous and synchronous modules and webinars. And we found that adherence to the principles varied across the programs. While some programs scored overall more, more highly than others, none of the programs had a high adherence across all of the principles. A low adherence or this variety in, in adherence may signify a lack of appreciation for their importance in enhancing knowledge acquisition and long-term retention. This means that the program content may not be reaching the family physician's practice or their patient population. In conclusion, a similar framework can be used by program developers to facilitate the incorporation of best practices. Also, future work should focus on family physicians since individual health professional groups have been found to exhibit differences in learning outcomes following e-learning. And with that, I'll open it up to any questions. Great, thank you, uh, Stephanie. Teresa Chan has a question. Was this a novel adherence scale or something that's been previously used? 
She sees it as a great opportunity here for you to exp simply explain that process as a methods and scoring paper. Um, it was not used previously in this context. However, it was based on a previously, previously developed uh, framework, um, the learning object review instrument. Mm -hmm. um, so it wasn't made from scratch by influenced by but influenced by a few previously developed frameworks. And for those of you who may not be familiar with the learning object review uh, framework, it's referred to as the LORI instrument and that you can access um, online um, as well. And just thinking about the different principles and the level of adherence, did you find um, through your analysis that there was one or a couple of the principles that was more adhered to than others across the program? Um, they were adhered to differently. So for example, the personalization principle, that includes, other than using conversational style, it also includes the use of a virtual coach. Um, and most of the programs did not include the virtual coach. Um, Similarly, the multi, or on the other hand, the multimedia principle, most of the programs did use uh, words and graphics, so there weren't kind of solely text-based programs. Okay, excellent. And just another sharing from our um, chat from Teresa, that this is an adaptation of the LORI. Um, the LORI doesn't have a one to five scale for each item. So just something to consider about, um, you know, um, as you move forward, that this might actually be a useful framework for others, especially as we might want to use different scales to be able to evaluate our own um, initiatives as we go forward, as well as be able to help better inform, not only with uh, informing about the different principles, but then how do you assess whether you've actually incorporated those principles or not. So a uh, great idea uh, for you to be able to put that together. Thank you for great. the suggestions. Great, thank you very much. All right, well, uh, Stephanie, I'll ask you to monitor the chat in case other things mm -hmm. come up as well. And uh, we're going to move um, on to, uh, we're gonna bring Celeste back. And hopefully her audio is uh, reconnected now. Um, Can you hear me now? I can hear you now. Perfect. So Thank I'm just going to get back to your presentation. <laughs> Second time's the charm. Uh, apologize, everyone. This didn't happen when I tested this out earlier today. <laughs> That's okay. Technology has a mind of its own, it seems. So I'm going to let you That's take true. it away, Celeste. Well, thank you so much. Uh, so my name is Celeste Stewart. Uh, I'm part of a team from the Department of Biochemistry and Biomedical Sciences, and we're looking at the impact of virtual reality laboratory simulations on student outcomes and motivation. So virtual reality, it's, it's an emerging field with claims that these immersive experiences can increase student motivation, interest, and subsequently their learning outcomes. Our study was looking at Labster laboratory simulations, which traditionally have been web-based lab simulations with subject areas ranging from biology to engineering. These 2D simulations have previously been documented to improve student learning outcomes and increase engagement with the material. At the time the study began, Labster had recently expanded into VR simulations. We were one of the first groups with access to this technology, and our goal was to determine if these new VR simulations had similar effects with respect to student outcomes and motivation, while also determining best practices, best practices on how to implement this technology. To do this, we recruited 39 McMaster undergraduate students, primarily from health sciences or biomedical engineering. Participants were assigned to one of two potential simulations. They were then given a pre-quiz to determine baseline knowledge, following which they would complete the lab simulation with a Lenovo Mirage headset. There was no time limit on completing the simulation. Participants could take however long they wanted to. Afterwards, participants were uh, given a post-quiz to complete to determine gains in knowledge, what we will be referring to as the learning outcomes. Following the quiz, students were given a survey about their experiences during the simulation. Now, here I have some simplified highlights of the data. If you want to see the full figure list and results, they're available on an online slide deck, but you can access with the QR code in the bottom right-hand corner. 
uh, one of the first things we looked at was the user experience, including any adverse effects. The most uh, commonly reported adverse effect was eye strain, with 51% reporting eye strain sometimes and 28% often or always. Uh, more serious vestibular symptoms like motion sickness, nausea, and headaches were far less common, thankfully, with nearly 75 participants rarely or never experiencing them. In the qualitative feedback we received, participants also commented on the weight of the headset uh, be, uh, posing a barrier to use, and the incidence of symptoms also appeared to be connected to prolonged use of the headset without breaks. Similar to past studies of Labster's web-based simulations, participants demonstrated an increase in quiz score following the VR simulations. However, future work needs to be done to compare this increase in learning outcomes with the increase which may come from more typical pedagogical methods, such as a lecture. We also found trends in students' motivation and interest similar to those found in other VR studies. Uh, here we have two of the 13 items that we asked participants about in figure three, um, all of which, uh, out of, so these are two of the sample ones that I was able to include on the slide, but of the 13 that we asked, they all had highly positive responses. In the qualitative feedback, participants commented on how they liked that simulations allowed for the speeding up of time. Experiments that in the real world would take multiple weeks to see from start to finish, they could see an overview in 30 minutes. One of the negatives brought up by participants though was the inability to select incorrect options. Unlike in a real lab where small mistakes can be made and not realized until the end and then eventually learned from, these simulations would not allow participants to proceed until the correct answers were selected. In conclusion, uh, this preliminary evidence suggests that VR simulations could be used to supplement existing laboratory experiences and also that VR uh, experiences need to have built-in rest periods to minimize the chance of eye strain and other vestibular symptoms. I would be happy to take any questions. Great, thanks very much Celeste. Uh, pleasure to listen to that. I know uh, I have lots of uh, friends, family and colleagues who love to play with VR in yeah. sort of their gaming at home scenario, but really taking a look at from an educational perspective, is this something we really should be starting to um, think about using and if so, how do we go about using it and where does it fit in, as you were saying, um, it might be a supplement. Um, a question from Bruce Wayman. Um, it is clear that they can learn in VR. Do we know how the simulation worked compared to a real lab experience? So with regard, just a little clarification for that question, how closely it mirrored the laboratory experience um, in terms of those outcomes? If that is the question, then uh, the team at Labster, they have their design team there. Um, they're able to mirror things fairly closely. For certain things, I know right now they're expanding more into their anatomy and physiology seg uh, segments. So unlike the more um, basic laboratory experiments where you learn how to do an ELISA, which is very true to life, in which case um, very realistic and what could go wrong and what could go right, things more like uh, anatomy, physiology, I think they're doing one on endocrinology. It's more of a, how would I describe it, a magic school bus-like event where you can go in and see things a little bit more closely. But in the ones where they're replicating a laboratory environment, they try to be a bit more true to life. Excellent. And from Sam Jarman, I'm happy to see positive, positive results for qualitative engagement measures. I'm curious if you have any insight into measures of transfer from the VR experience to the clinical setting. Okay, so in the use of a more clinical setting. I will admit that is not my area of expertise, but based on what I've read and I know what is come and from what I know is coming down the pipeline at Labster, they are expanding their simulations for medical environments. They've started off with one for diabetes that's a bit more patient focused and centered around that. In terms of transferring to the clinical setting, one of uh, some of the data I wasn't able to go over today was students felt very strongly that although this was a good supplement, it didn't fully replicate some of the laboratory environment, that trial and error, which um, based on my readings, I think would also apply to a clinical setting. You wouldn't be able to fully capture that, but it could be used as for case studies uh, where you can go through a controlled test environment as a group or individually, but then come back after sharing a collective experience. Excellent. Thank you very much for sharing uh, your insight. And as we wrap up our session here, I'd like to thank all of the speakers for sharing uh, your wonderful studies and providing us with some more 
insight into the research that's going on in the education sphere. And thank you everyone for joining us for this technology related session. And a gentle reminder to you that closing remarks are going to be made by Jonathan Sherbino in the main room. That was the same room that you had the opening remarks in, in about five minutes time. So thank you very much everyone and I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you.